Riley Nelson started 19 games at quarterback at BYU, wrapped up a four-year run as the color analyst on BYU Radio. He knows all about spring practice, joins us. Good morning, Riley. How are we doing? Doing great. This year, it's probably more like winter practice as it feels <laughs> like every morning we wake up with another inch of snow on the ground, but uh, it's great to have football back nonetheless. Seriously, there's too much snow around here, but at least they're all indoors where where Belo could stay warm all those years. That was important. Yeah, you, you know, I, I was I was at practice yesterday talking to some of the coaches, and, and they were saying how mad, um, you know, they were when they played. They didn't have the IPF like we did. And, and I said, you know what, I'm happy we had the IPF because I wouldn't have came here if that was <laughs> no. the case at all. I mean, let's be honest, during spring ball, there was probably days when B. Logan in the IPF was like, hey, can we get one of those heat cannons <laughs> over here? It's even a little bit too chilly. No, but it, hey, whether it was uh, 95 and humid or it was 20 degrees and frosty, B. Log always came ready to play for the Cougars. It's right. These practices that are spread out between now and, and the middle of April, how important are they for a team that's getting ready for the Big 12? Extremely important. I think a couple of things for specific for this BYU team. Obviously, the defense uh, has new leadership, new coaches, new systems. So that is extremely important. Not to mention, they just they they need to kind of remind themselves of the success that they can have. Right? It, it, they were getting criticized off the field. The play uh, I know for a lot of them wasn't up to their expectations uh, on that side of the ball, and so getting an opportunity in the spring to kind of level set and reset is is great for the defense. And then anytime you're replacing a player like Jaron Hall, the offense needs its chance to get out there and, you know, who's going to step up, who's going to rise, not just at, obviously, first and foremost, at the quarterback position, but around it. Anytime an offense is bringing in uh, a new quarterback into the program, whether or not he started previously at other places or not, you need other players around him to stand up. And it's not just Jaron Hall. Obviously, we saw what Blake Freeland did get, getting all that attention uh, at, at the NFL Combine, right? So you're, you're replacing things at the offensive line. Puka Nakua was far and away the best uh, offensive weapon that they had, and, he, and he's not coming back. So there's plenty of this. The spring provides such a great opportunity for the for the next generation of the Jaron Halls, Puka Nakua's, Blake Freeland's. Uh, Riley, speaking of the, the quarterbacks and, and spring ball, and I could say this, I say this respectfully as a defensive player. There's really not a lot of pass rush, right? We, get, we can't touch you guys, we can't even touch you guys off the field or, or else we get in trouble. Um, and, and so when it comes to spring ball, uh, what are some of the quarterback, when it comes to quarterback position, what are some of the things that you guys are practicing? Uh, practicing? Um, what's, what's your focus and your mentality going into a spring ball? People take it for granted, but a big part of the quarterback is just having the offense run smoothly, right? Like you get the play call, you call the play in the huddle, or you you manage communication in no huddle situations and never be in a position where what happens often with uh, especially new quarterbacks in a new system is like you're constantly the play clock. For a guy who's a multi-year starter and a guy who has been in a system a long time, the play clock almost like fades into the background. It is completely irrelevant to what you're doing out on the field. But for a new quarterback, it becomes a nuisance. And, you know, if you let a few here, you know, slip here or there, first and 15 is a lot worse. Or sorry, yeah, first and 15 is a lot worse than first and 10. And it was all because you couldn't manage the tempo of the offense for pre-snap, right, before the ball's even snapped. So that's a huge thing. Get used to the verbiage. Get used to the checks. Get used to, you know, the protections. Get used to alerting different blitzes. Get used to the side adjust routes. So a lot of it is that can be done with that, even though you're not facing live bullets and contact as a quarterback. And then from there, uh, it's everyone talks about, and it's very obvious, uh, to, route running and timing with receivers, right? Where do guys like the ball? Some guys like it. If you're going to miss, you'd rather miss, you know, forehead or up. Obviously, the ideal throw, you put the you put the ball on everyone's chin. But some guys have no problem kind of extending up. Other guys prefer in tight windows to have the ball into their body. So outside of just getting used to how guys run routes, it's also how do they how can I put the ball in the best position for them to have the highest likelihood of success. But that also comes into play with running backs. Running back tracks are a little different. Some guys like the ball more up in their pads. Some guys like it down in the belly. And it's not just figuring those things out, but then it's repping them over and over and over again to where things just feel comfortable and natural. You know, Rebel never let you talk this long. I think this is why you're like coming on BYU Sports Nation. 
Riley hey, Nelson with us. So look, you transferred in. Keaton Slovis transferred in. Put yourself in his shoes and Cougar Nation in, in his shoes. And, and what, what's he trying to get done here this spring? I hope that he is trying just every day and in every minute in meetings, in the locker room, uh, in every interaction with his teammates to prove that he is the guy. I am always leery of situations where a guy is brought in and there is an expectation that he is the starter without ever having putting the pads on. Uh, now, Keaton Slovis has started at two other P5 programs. We, you've got film on him. You can see everything that he's doing. So you don't necessarily have questions about whether or not the guy can play. But as we saw with the neighbors to the north, right, they bring in a guy who threw for 10,000 yards in the Big 12, and they hand the ball to him game one without – well, it turns out that – the other guy who had been in the program previously, who had kind of sat and waited his turn, he was actually the guy. Of course, I'm referring to Charlie Brewer and Cam Rising. And I dealt with that a lot different. I came in and sat behind Max. Like, I knew there was a pecking order. I knew I had to earn myself as the backup. and thing. But then immediately I find myself in a situation where that expectation was there for Jake. Like, the expectation was, okay, he's a true freshman, so maybe he doesn't start game one. But, you know, we need to get – we need to pave the way so that he is in there. He is the guy. And that is a dangerous place both. It's dangerous culturally, and it's a dangerous place for the players because you never know what a guy has until, you know, those live bullets start coming at him in, in the field of play with, with the teams around him. So I hope Keaton, re regardless of his starting prowess and his resume coming, comes in here like a true freshman would wanting to absolutely, you know, earn the respect of his teammates, coaches, staff, and everybody else uh, from the ground up. From what I know about him, I don't know him personally, I haven't had the chance to meet him, but everything I hear about him is he is doing that, he is going about the right way. But anytime there's any sniff of entitlement, uh, it should make you nervous for a football team's culture. You know what, R Riley, I, gotta, I, could, I can testify to that. Um, obviously, I was a part um, of, that, of that quarterback battle with you and, and Jake and Spring, and you know, I don't know if you heard this story. I just started saying it, so I, I apologize. I'm, I'm confessing. I remember going into that spring ball, and I kind of was – I was tilted towards Jake, right? And, and going back to your point of, um, you know, it, it's not a really good situation to be in from a culture standpoint, and, it's, and especially because I already had chosen size, right? So much to where I remember dropping balls, like dropping interceptions when he was throwing them to me. Uh, just because I wanted him to win. So, you know, I... I That's I, like, like a gross violation of the code. I, you know, I, I know, I know. And then it got to the point where I remember getting an interception from him, and he came over to me, and he was like, you're not supposed to do that. And I was like, you stop throwing me the ball then. Stop, <laughs> stop throwing it on my side. Throw the Brenner side. <laughs> so, um, but you know what? So I, I apologize. And going back to what you said, yeah, like, we, we kind of were divided in the locker room because... We already had in our mind. I mean, it, it was Team Riley, then it was Team Jake. Instead of just letting you guys, you know, um, go out and, and earn it, um, and then and then let the team follow whoever you know they they decided. And you know, you saw that last year or the the, the next year when you came in um, for Jake Utah State. And I would say this: I, I kind of righted my wrongs because I was I did stand up and started cheering Riley, Riley. So, you know, I feel like I got your back in, in that sense. But I think you're absolutely right, man, when it, when it comes to, um, you know, making sure that these quarterbacks prove themselves. Every situation is different, right? We're, taught, we're now 10 years, more than 10 years removed from that, right? That, that competition was happening in spring of 2010. So we're 13 years removed from it. So I, I don't always need to bring it up, but it is a personal experience that I have uh, to be able to speak to situations like this. It's a new coaching staff. Heck, it's a new day. Like, these players are different. Transferring was, back then, you still had to sit out a year, right? And uh, the, even the rankings have gotten so much more mature, right? So Jake came in as a four-star back then, and the rankings and all this. But it's just, I guess I'll just say this. Everyone thinks they know what they have, and but no one really knows until you see it on the field. And so you're just, you just do your best to create as much stressful game-like situations as you can during spring. You're obviously gonna ramp that up even more in fall camp. And you just, as a coach, you hope you make the right decision. You're trotting the, the right decision out there, game one, week one. Uh, and if you're not, hopefully that you've given the opportunity to develop other guys uh, in the depth chart that can come in and do what needs to be done. I'm just glad we're able to get together to get this off your chest after all these years. I, 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 you know, I feel so bad because, you know, 
I, I would consider Riley, you know, one of my good friends. He was actually in, the, in the, my very first class um, that I took here at BYU, which is Pearly Great Price, which is very interesting. But, I mean, he's been with me, you know, every that's step of the way. That's just my fire, baby. That's, uh, that's, <laughs> uh, Absolutely. I, I still remember to this day every other word the teacher said. I said, who? Joseph, who? He saw what? What happened? And Riley would, you know, yeah, bend over and whisper to me. So he'll stick with Riley. You know, he, yeah, you, you know, he, uh, he, I, I, I love Riley, and, and so that's why I wanted to get off my chest because I, I, I felt yeah, bad. I feel I better. You. That Thank you. Feel bad. Thank you. I appreciate it. Right. Forgive him, man. Hey, yeah. I'm sorry for not throwing you more picks. You could know, <laughs> have, you could have helped him out. Right. Uh, one thing that Slovis does have is 34 starts against P5 opponents going into the Big 12 where there's a run of 10 straight P5 starting with Arkansas. Uh, that experience alone should give him enough street cred, and it sounds like it has for everyone to go, we're following you because we've actually never been there. Exactly, and I thought I was super excited. I, I knew they had to go to the portal. Once Jaron announced, uh, I knew, every, we all knew, right? It wasn't insider information. We knew we had to go to the portal. It was just a question of who are we going to get? Are, are you going to get a disgruntled backup? Are you going to... You know, what What are really your options? I think to land a player of the caliber of Keaton Slovis was an absolute win for Roderick and Kalani and all those guys. Look, coaching change at USC, right? And then he goes to Pitt, and I'm sure you guys have documented it, but and, and most serious BYU football fans have too. He goes there, and then the coach that recruited him there takes another job, and he kind of lets – he gets stuck in a situation that wasn't the one that he chose, right? It kind of got switched on him last minute – and so I know he's just looking for stability. He's looking for uh, an opportunity to showcase his, um, to showcase what he can do as a player in a stable environment. I think he has that in BYU. Obviously, Coach Sitake has been here, and I don't think there's any questions about his role as being the leader of this program. You have the same thing with Aaron Roderick and the leader and, and play caller and offensive coordinator. And so, you know, for Keaton Slovis to come here and lead us into our first season of the Big 12, honestly, it's the best it's it's probably the best situation that you could ever ask for. Let's stick with the quarterback theme. The uh, quarterbacks for the alumni game were announced earlier today. Uh, Ty Detmer coming back, Max Hall, John Beck, and Brandon Doman. Fabulous four selections. My question, and Matt Berry is also in that group, but my question for you is, was the NIL situation what kept you away from committing <laughs> to this year's game? Were you Were you seeking something that they could not deliver? <laughs> So, you know, they kept on, like, trying to – so Billy and the equipment staff were always so good to uh, give us, Mitch and I, and, you know, Greg's always got to be dressed into the nines, but they gave us a nice little, like, care package for being on the broadcast team, right? So, like, I kept my gear, and so we, I didn't negotiate in dollars. I was negotiating <laughs> gear, and the gear package just wasn't quite there. And they kept saying, well, you've got that gear from the broadcast team. I was like, that was a separate contract. No, I'm kidding, Dave. <laughs> I would uh, – look, um, and the, the thing about quarterback is only one dude can play in an alumni situation. You can't have all of us – there's not enough pass attempts to go around, right? Um, because you want to see guys get in there. You want to get a rhythm. Heck, the, the shoulder joint takes is going to take at least half a dozen throws to – loosen up for any of us so uh i didn't get the invite this year but uh for future years i'll be down there with my boys we watched it on tv uh last year yeah. but this year as long as it's not snowing we plan to be in the stadium and hope to have a great time i see a day when there's the left-handed riley throwing against the left-handed steve in a clash of titans at lavelle edwards stadium that'd be a good one and you know what? I'm already like I'm get I get I'm like giddy about the fact that I'm gonna get showed up by a guy 30 years older than me. And I know that's gonna happen. Come on, man, a Hall of Famer. There are levels to this game. I am not. I, I I didn't get the invite this year. I hope to have it in the future. I will say yes whenever I do get the invite. But look, man, I'm self-aware enough. There's a ranking order to this. It goes Heisman. You know, then you got NFL draft picks and John Beck and Brandon Doman. Then you've got the all-time winningest quarterback in BYU history and Max Hall. Like, I am not. Uh, I don't think you know. What? I don't think those guys got their name chanted. You know, like you did. You know, <laughs> Riley, Riley, Riley. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, there's levels, but then there, there's also levels of competition. And I know you don't back down at all. 
I'll stay warm, you know, because I will always pride myself on my athleticism. If it does get too cold for you, B Log, I'll step in, you know, play some of that field corner. For oh, you. please, please. We, I mean, we can make a deal right now. We can, we can rotate every three plays. I'm, that, I'm okay, one, that. We, one thing we do know is, is, is there's a list of the toughest quarterbacks in BYU history, and, and Riley Nelson's right at the top. Absolutely. Right no, at the thank top. You, Dave. Thank, thank you for your time. We'll see, uh, we'll see you down here at the alumni game here in a, in a few weeks. And, and uh, best of luck to you moving forward. We'll see you soon. You bet. Always a pleasure.